Hey team, you're about to experience my interview with Arno Ham. He is the co-founder and CTO of Sauna Commerce, and he has been working specifically in the B2B e-commerce space for nearly 13 years. Sauna Commerce is a B2B focused e-commerce platform that integrates with ERP at the core of its functionality. We had a fantastic conversation, and this guy knows so much about B2B e-commerce. I think you're going to get a ton out of this one. Welcome to B2B Commerce Corner. Commerce Corner is a sub-series of the e-commerce edge podcast discussing all things B2B commerce through the lens of agencies, consultants, merchants, and more. Enjoy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the podcast. I have a cracking guest lined up for you today that I think we're gonna we're gonna learn a lot from. I know I certainly will. Welcome, Arno Ham from Sana Commerce. Welcome, Arno. Yeah, thanks, Jason. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I, thanks for being the show. My my absolute pleasure, and it's great to have you along for the ride today. And I was recently featured on your podcast, so uh, thank you very much for hosting me on there. And anybody who isn't following the Santa Commerce podcast, please go out and follow that on all the major podcast channels and check out the episode with me. If you like my content and you like what I do, I think that Arno asked a whole lot of very good, very unique questions of me during our session together. So definitely go and check that out. So thanks for hosting me on yours, and, and it's great to be able to return the favor. We had a great conversation, and I think that what where we overlap is our love of B2B commerce. But before we get into Sana and what you do there, and you're the CTO, and you were the CPO there, maybe tell us just very briefly about your background, how you have a software engineering background. You've been working in the technical side of e-commerce and technology for many years now. And maybe just run us through the short version of how you got to be where you are and what drew you into the e-commerce world to begin with. Yeah, so yeah, I have my background in computer science. I was a nerd or a geek programmer. And that's how I started actually 20 years ago at a company, I actually at a digital agency. It was in the beginning, at least here in the on this side of the ocean in Europe, beginning I would say of e-commerce and then especially focused on retail or consumer, right? So, uh, we were working for all the major brands like Heineken, the local po- or the national postal services, uh, so big brands. And uh, But at some point in time, so we were doing project after project, we got a little bit famous about doing e-commerce and we did that well, but we got more customers coming to us or actually prospects saying, hey, we want e-commerce or an e-commerce solution and we know that you guys can do well, but it's not for the consumer market, but it's for another part of the business we are running. And these are our business customers or that was actually, we never heard about B2B. So we're just finding a name and just say, yes, our B2B customers or B2B buyers that we want to serve. And yeah, guess what? It's a little bit different. It's more complexity because yeah, we are negotiating prices. We are, inventory is important for them. There's regulation around it. And yeah, we have everything now also stored or this information we have trying to put in an ERP system that uh, or we moved actually from Excel to an ERP system. So we were doing these kind of projects and we were integrating with them step by step and every time actually the same and uh, then at some point in time we thought hey let's let's uh, let's automate that let's implement let's invent something that we do not need to integrate it every project time after time because yeah a big portion of the budgets were spent for these clients on making that integration work we thought hey we need to do that smarter and um, then on, on on a night with with a couple of pizzas and a couple of other developers we just tried to make an ERP make it like the e-commerce engine for B2B and and, and it worked and from there, let's say Sana was born. And that is, yeah, that was in 2008. And then, yeah, now fast forward, we are now having 1500 customers all over the world, processing hundreds of, or, yeah, billions of GMV, US dollar GMV to do all those platforms. So yeah, that that's an awesome journey. And actually, yeah, long story short, I just got hooked on B2B. I think it's such an interesting area. You learn every day something new about goods that you can buy, not as a consumer, but they are there, right? Ingredients or certain spare parts, or there are a lot of so many businesses that are su- supporting other businesses to do their business. And yeah, it's a very interesting playing field. And it's also from an IT perspective, a complex, but an interesting world to automate or to, yeah, to do something good there and to help our customers and our B2B buyers in, in their, their transformation to, to go from manual ordering to digital or to, yeah. That's what keeps me, keeps me motivated or keeps my interest all the time. 
Great. So that means that you're obviously a co-founder of Sana. So not only have you taken kind of technical roles and product roles within the business, but you helped to bring this business to life. And I love the fact that you are scratching an itch, right? You had this experience in the industry. You said, look, there's a gap here that we think we've identified uniquely that we are in a position to fill that will allow us to automate our processes because instead of building everything bespoke every single time, which just feels like recreating the wheel, you said to yourself, actually, why don't we build this front end that can have some native out-of-the-box integrations with key ERP backends that we're seeing come up time and time again in the industry. And you decided to standardize on Microsoft Dynamics and SAP as the two primary ERPs that you integrate with. So I love that sort of journey that you went through of, hey, this is my experience. This is what I've been through. This is what I see as a gap in the market. And I think that when you have market pull versus market push, that means that there's a much higher likelihood of adoption of your technology. If you're a builder, if you're creating something in the world and you want it to be adopted widely, I think identifying that ideal product market fit as early as possible so that you get market pull, meaning there's already existing demand that you can tap into, I think that's a really important part of ensuring that your platform has a good chance of success. And would you say that is what contributed to you guys being, seeing success early on, seeing early traction? It was like, hey, we've got almost a ready-made market here. We recognize that through our agency work. And if we build it, they will come. It's almost like the field of dreams, right? If we build it, yeah. they will come. And so you had market pull almost from day one. Correct. And we are a fast growing company already from day one. Let's say double digit growth year over year. And, and we could fund ourselves as well, which is also pretty, pretty interesting. We're still not externally funded. So that's awesome. And the, and the point here is, I think that, yes, it was, a, I would say, complete green field. And, but we are still serving that wave, let's say, of B2B e-commerce adoption. In, in consumer business, I would say it's highly adopted, maybe hun close to 100%, right? Everybody... Every brand, every retailer has a digital platform or is transacting online with their consumers. But in B2B, there is still, yeah, it's a 40% still is, is on manual transactions. There's still, and 10 years back when we started this whole journey then, or, or even a little bit further, that, that was even worse. It's, the wave is still going on and, and we can help still so many companies. And that's interesting, really interesting. Yeah. And as you say, it's what makes you want to get up at the at every single day and attack the market and have a good time and enjoy what you're doing and feel motivated and feel inspired to work with these new B2B brands that are lagging. And based on my experience, I would, if I had to stick my finger in the air and pull a number out of the air, I would say B2B e-commerce seems to be a roughly a decade behind in terms of both adoption and maturity and tools and platforms and integrations and all the infrastructure and the cottage industry around B2B seems to be about a decade roughly behind e-commerce. And so therefore right. I see the opportunity, not just in terms of adoption of digital technologies within these businesses and the level of digital transformation they need to go through to get there. But more importantly, I think there is in tandem with that, there's a tremendous amount of B2B DTC focused technology that will need to come ultimately to the B2B playing field to allow these businesses to level up. And it doesn't it's not just the ERP and it's not just the e-commerce platform. We have personalization technology, marketing automation, CDPs, PIM systems, and there's so much enablement technology in the market that is so heavily skewed today towards B2C and D2C that I think we all have to help the industry collectively level up to bring these capabilities to the B2B sector. And then, of course, there's the human component and there's the fact that the people who specialize in B2B e-commerce are a very tiny subset of the specialists in e-commerce. And so therefore, the resources available to B2B businesses, they're harder to find. And they tend to be a little bit more expensive because anybody who specializes in that space, they're a rarity. They're almost like a unicorn. If we commerce and you know B2B and you understand both of those, you are a true unicorn in the space. And so have you seen in that time, now you've been doing this for 13 years now, nearly 13 years, and the reality is the B2B space has matured quite a lot in that time, but overall, generically speaking, it's still very immature from an enablement perspective. 
Correct, correct. So I would say the a lot of companies, even the larger ones that I speak to, let's say from a majority perspective, they I would consider them still very immature or just just starting. They they still are figuring out to get the basics right. And the point here is that is not to to say something bad about these organizations or the people that work at these organizations. It's just a matter of fact that it is extremely more complex to get it done right and even get the basics done right. So that is that that is just something a lot of companies are not realizing on a, when they are starting that journey. The benefit is huge as well. So if you can ha, always, if there is a lot of complexity or difficult to solve, there is also a lot of value, right? So that is always in balance. The companies that figure it out or then that can make make it work, they benefit a lot. Customers roughly on our customer base are growing with 30% year over year, and depends a little bit on how you calculate the number it can be also moving from offline to digital or just in growing in the total right so the both both contribute to that number but the important here is that on both sides if you're growing your market share or you're moving more to digital the return on investments is anyway there right or you're saving cost or you can utilize these costs in a different way to to grow or expand some other part of the business yeah? by moving offline to to online or you're growing anyway your market right because you because the technology helps you to try other countries or to try you other segments to yeah to explore and to and to see if you can do business there yeah and i would say it's rapidly growing in that sense the maturity is growing in that sense as well so all the systems that you just mentioned and we're just making a small step aside but i think it's important as well about ERP, we also realized a couple of years ago that the ERP is not the only thing anymore, also at B2B organizations. However, still a lot of organizations rely or have a lot of their processes and data in these ERP systems. But with, with the trend of composability, which is not only in e-commerce, but also in ERPs, in CRMs, just in the whole software industry, where package package business capabilities, small pieces of what you can do with a system, if it's searching or if it is checkout or it's payment or it's invoicing or it's just product information management. We have seen this trend that you can say, hey, maybe it should not be in a monolithic thing and everybody's doing everything. We got these specialized organizations that can do one thing really well. So when we understood that also with the help of analysts and what we're seeing in, in, in the market, we also went on that on, on, on that truck and we made our solution more composable because we see that not all customers yet, but the ones that are getting much more mature to grow further, they need that ability. And what is actually it allows you to do is that if you say, hey, you know, Sana comes with search, for example, but we are also not the search experts. We do a pretty good job, but there are better vendors out there, right? So they are only, I have 350 people in my team roughly and a bunch of them are on search, but there are also companies that have 300 people just on search. So yeah, they can just do a better job. They should be. So that's also the, yeah, we created, made a solution extensible or also yeah, modular and that you can swap functionalities that you can say, hey, I'm now at a certain maturity level that I maybe can use an external search provider and that can help me to make the next step. But then also what you mentioned, I want to really emphasize that, yeah, but just recently this week, closed a deal with Tweakwise, which is a search fan. And that was the first one that we really saw that also had true B2B capabilities. Can handle large volume of catalog, right? In, in, in the hundred thousands or millions of records, can handle a price differentiation or catalog differentiation between on, on customer level in a good way. Can handle big amounts of attributes because in B2B we like to, there are sometimes cases where we have hundreds or you have a large list of attributes because the products that you're selling are just are in need of that. They are complex to explain it and they differ on small things and so on. Or they have algorithms to do cross and upsell, but they might work for B2C scenarios where you are that one time visitor and you're just browsing around. But for B2B, when you're a recurring visitor, maybe continuously have that website open or app. There are other algorithms where then you need to have these models optimized in different ways. And then we have this partnership. So we are also in that, that there are not so many yet that are really are also truly specialized in, in, in B2B, but they are there and we are working with them together. And But then we still take that philosophy that we had from the beginning and 
that is what we call pre-built integrations. We started with that with ERP, and that means actually that half of our source code or half of our IP is also in the other side of the system. And also with search, it's, in, it's the same story. So if you're going to with a partnership or if you are going to integrate another system, we want to do it really well. We just not we are not only exposing a couple of APIs and documentation and just say, okay, you can write some glue code or you can. No, we want to make an add-on or we want to make some a module or something that you can install or something that you can configure and click and enable. And that is really well and, and good. Of course, to do that, you need all those APIs, you need all the documentation, but we're also creating dedicated teams. We are hiring people that are specialized also on the from that other vendor. And we are also making sure that it's certified. And we're also making sure that our APIs are not only about data extraction, create, update, or delete, but also that we can read the metadata around it. So how is this system actually constructed? Are there any custom fields out there? Or is the logic behaving differently so that we can adopt on that? So I think we are taking 10 or 20 steps more than competition is doing in that area. And that's fine because yeah, we are specialized in this where they are maybe more specialized in retail or in other functionalities, right? You need to take your, you need to take your position. So that long story, but I think it, it covers a little bit both. So to summarize, yes, most of them are still quite immature, but that's because it's so complex. But for the ones that are getting more mature, we are, yeah, we see that whole composability shift. I think that you raise a very good point. I'm working with a client now and with where we've architected this new solution for them. They're about 75% D2C and about 25% B2B. They chose to go the route of having a fully integrated storefront front end to where they don't have a separate B2B experience to the B2C experience. They wanted to have them conjoint. Once they get to maybe 50 to 75% B2B, then maybe it makes sense to have a completely dedicated B2B storefront. But one of the challenges we ran into was that a lot of the vendors of the different supporting technology that we're going to integrate with the e-commerce platform, they are pure B2C platforms. They have a little bit of an idea of B2B, but not much and not a tremendous amount of experience with B2B. And one of those platforms that we had to do a bit of extra work around was the search and merch platform. Now, they understand that in the B2B world, there are price lists. They understand in the B2B world, there are different currencies that we have to think about. And they understand those things, I guess, from a theoretical perspective, but then surfacing those in a meaningful way back to the front end logic so that the front end logic can then display the correct price when a customer is authenticated versus unauthenticated or authenticated as a retail customer versus a trade customer. Those things were something that even when they did their discovery, and they knew that this business had 25% of its business in B2B, they didn't, when they did their architecture of providing effectively the integration roadmap to this SI, to the system integrator, the agency that was doing the build, they didn't take that into account. And so when we started doing testing, we and the agency, everybody had the assumption because we talked about that B2B component with them right from the start, we all assumed that would be supported from day one when we started our testing. We realized when we had a trade account that was authenticated for user acceptance testing, we realized they weren't seeing, they were seeing the standard price. They weren't seeing their dedicated price. So we had to go back. We had to have the conversation with them. We had to do a supplementary integration from the e-commerce website, which is integrated with the ERP and pulling in price list. We then had to push out those customer specific or customer group specific price lists to the search and merge platform so that when its data came in, the front end logic had the prices to present to the correct customers when they were authenticated. So I think to your point, if you're using and leveraging advanced technology that is primarily focused into the B2C and D2C world and creating that really nuanced customer experience for that niche, then you have to take extra care and extra caution and extra thought when you're starting to think about, okay, what is the impact in a B2B environment of that technology? And there's just so much, as you say, because B2B businesses, by definition, are so much more complex. They've got MOQs, they've got indent ordering, they've got unique and custom catalogs, they've got custom price lists, and sometimes those are down to the customer level or customer group level. We've got request a quote, we've got, there's so many functions, and we could rattle on for another 10 minutes probably Mm -hmm. about the complexities that are unique to different B2B businesses and different B2B verticals in particular, because that's the thing. Whereas in in the oftentimes, regardless of the vertical, the technology that is out there for B2C, D2C land can be adapted very quickly regardless of vertical. In B2B, vertical matters 
a lot and there's a lot of unique complexity by vertical. And so I think what you spoke to there is the fact that yes, there is a lot of technology out there that can potentially benefit B2B businesses, but man, there is definitely some deep dive discovery that needs to take place to make sure you're not missing some critical functionality that is unique to that business or vertical. Correct, correct. Yeah, so just a couple of things to underline or to share my opinion on these things because I think you mentioned very valid points. So the reason why we actually are all doing this, what we just mentioned, is that we know, and you just mentioned it in your own words, is that, yeah, for example, based on the investigation from Gartner, we see with ERP implementation or CRM implementations, the largest systems in these landscapes, around 60% of the budgets are being spent on integration, on and that is also what you see here when doing B2B e-commerce or D2C as well. If you run into these scenarios, the solution is to do that integration, right? And you're spending budget on it. But that's scenario after scenario until it is right. Yeah, you easily get up to that 60%, right? So that is the whole thing why, from a cost perspective, why we say, hey, we can do that differently and we can do that more easily. But on the other side of the coin is also that, yeah, we, we truly believe, that's why we are actually a niche player, let's say we've laser focus on b2b because we truly believe that it is different there is always this saying yeah b2b and b2c it's going to be the same yes it is from how it looks or how it should feel um, as a b2b buyer it should be that feeling that it is as easy as doing a b2c order but to make that magic happen a lot of things and you just made a summary a lot of things need to be in place and and we are and it's also as a vendor we are a vendor of course it's a long journey. It's a long journey to get all that functionality in place. And it's a long journey to get all that functionality working to a certain amount of vertical scenarios. Or yeah, and I think even Asana, we are taking a subset of verticals because we simply cannot do all in a really, or it will take time till we can do all. And we do pretty good in manufacturing businesses, wholesale, multi-layer distribution, as well as, of course, automotive, if you talk more about segments, automotive, spare parts, food, everything which is really complex. Yeah, if you have B2B that is not really requiring that complexity or actually just like B2C, it's more like consumables that you're selling with nothing complex and also not even pricing differentiation or something. Yeah, you can maybe better do it with a B2C vendor or store because it's actually, it looks like it is B2B because of your, the clients that you're serving are B2B buyers, but the journey or the complexity is more more likely to B2C. So we also, yeah, so we say, okay, it should it should feel like B2C. We, can, we want to give that really smooth experience, but the complexity and all the functionality to have that in place, the benefits and the value that we bring to our customers is, yeah, that's a totally different story and, and often underestimated. And that's why we're having the podcast last year. We started with that also to, uh, to warn team managers or sales directors that want to say, hey, we, we are in a need to change something or we have adoption issues on our current platform and that we can warn them and that we can put them in the right direction or we can say, hey, these are the do's and don'ts to do. Of course, it would be nice with Sana, but in general, just to help the industry in that sense that we say, hey, there are just lessons that we like to share. I think that is if you are a B2B thought leader, it's your duty to do, right? So I think that's uh, that's why we started that. Yeah, and I concur entirely. There's when I started this podcast focused on B2B, apart from yours and the Trellis podcast and only mm -hmm. one or two others, there's probably a hundred very popular, very successful B2C slash D2C Correct. podcasts out there around e commerce. Yep. And they're all very mostly very successful and there's very regional podcasts focused on this, but in the B2B space, you can count them on two hands or less. The B2B focused content syndicates, for lack of a better term, wh whether that's video, whether that's audio, whether it's podcasts, whatever it is, whether that's lunch and learns, etc. There's very little out there that's really mm -hmm. truly focused on B2B. And that's where I saw the gap in you. It's I feel it's like my duty the, my podcast may not lead to a single new client for me directly. But the ones that maybe do come to me ultimately will hopefully be in a much more informed, educated position when they do yes. so that they're actually going to be better clients. They're going to they're going to have better budgets. They're going to have better internal resourcing before they ever even think about reaching out to me or you or anybody else in the B2B space. So I believe that a rising tide floats all boats. And so if I can help the B2B industry get better and be more informed and really understand truly the complexity that will be involved in translating 
their manual processes of today to digital equivalents in the digital world, if they can understand what that looks like and they can go on a journey of what I would say preparation prior to transformation, then that's going to make the world a better place for all B2Bs. Because what's going to happen is, I think, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, what I'm seeing happen slowly in the industry is that more and more B2B merchants are willing to share their story of digital transformation today than they were even one, two, three years ago, because we now have more B2Bs going along that journey. Yes. Whereas they've been willing to share their merchant stories for years at conferences and mm -hmm. roundtables and panels and everything else. But the B2B space is much more closed shop. It's historically, it's been, a lot of these brands and a lot of these verticals and categories their legacy brands, their legacy verticals, legacy categories. They maybe have never done e-commerce before by the time they get to me or you. This is their first time ever enabling e-commerce of any variety. They've never done EDI before. They've never had a punch out solution before. This is the very first time they've ever done transactional e-commerce in their business. And they're a little bit more shy. They're a little bit more inward facing. They're a little mm -hmm. bit more closed book. They're a little bit more protective of their yeah. niche. And that's understandable because historically, those brands have sent out <clears throat> legions of field sales reps to go out and fight for business and go knock on doors and sign people up and get them on trading terms and have a call cycle where they're going out and visiting them once a month or once a quarter and they're trying to sell them new products and source new products. So this industry is very much driven by that human-to-human -human sales connection. Almost all B2B businesses are focused on that human connection. And so once they digitalize all or part of their operations, they still have that mindset that this customer is mine. I need to have a monopoly in my space. I need to protect my relationship. But that attitude is definitely slowly starting to change. And I think the reason for that is because when they set out on their journey, they're struggling to find peers that they can model themselves on. So they have to trust consultancies and agencies and vendors, and they have to have a lot of trust because there just isn't a lot of merchant stories for them to learn from. And so they realize once they get through their journey, they realize actually we now need to start giving back. If we want this industry to get better, we have to start opening the kimono. So I'm definitely seeing at conferences like dedicated dedicated B2B conferences, B2B online by WBR in on the West Coast and in Florida, and, mm -hmm. and then the one that's put out by DC360, we're starting to see more content, more conferences, more events focused on B2B where merchants are actually willing to talk about what they've done that worked and didn't work. Are you seeing that slow evolution of the industry too? Yeah, no, definitely. And yeah, let's just talk about a couple of customer cases, or at least also the ones that are that were part, at least in my podcast show, right? They are ready now to open that door and to share all the good, the bad and the ugly of their journey going online. If they're, some are first generation, some are, let's say, second or third generation B2B e-commerce, so they, they, they were trying already for a while. But I think that showed already. That's why also I think from a SANA perspective, yeah, we tried to start maybe a podcast or other things in the past, but they were, it was always very hard to find customers that really wanted to speak or to share their story. But now they are there. So one, one thing is, for example, a case that is resonating for me. We, I had an interview a couple of months back with William and he's an IT director of a company which is called Montego and they are doing pet nutrition in South Africa. The continent of Africa and South Africa as a country as well is rather big. So they are a huge uh, manufacturing of dog food and they're selling it in the B2B space. So to other retailers or to other companies that are reselling them that product again. And yeah, one, one, one of the things we, we saw for him, he is an IT manager got, first of all, in his he, they did a little bit of B2B before, I think, with their own portal or did, tried something themselves, but they got so many tickets or issues from people that were replacing an order where pricing was not correct, for example, or the order was not processed uh, in the right way. And and we, we helped them. We looked into it and said, yeah, but you're you're having two silos running next to each other. That's not, they are not speaking to each other and you need to, you need to compose that B2B journey for your B2B buyers, which means that you need to take real-time inventory, real-time pricing. But then he said, yeah, but that will be taking a lot of time to maintain it because in our current system, we are we're doing pricing updates. We are busy for two days to make it happen. But yeah, that's 
where the technology comes in, if you have this pre-built integrations and everything is real time and automated or you with pricing, for example, yeah, these pricing updates are going automatically or if they have big pricing updates, they are spending maybe less than an hour to, to make that happen, right? So can you imagine from two days to less than an hour or continuously, or can you imagine from hundreds of tickets or a service request from something is going wrong where sales departments are being bothered with or your customer service department from almost close to zero, because just of, because of technology or a way of working, and that's major impact for these customers. And the result is this, that they can grow, they have happier customers, they can, and they also can extend because now working in South Africa, but they're taking other countries and other continents and they, they are living the dream. So that, that is one. And, and then, yeah, I think we have now around 30 episodes or so that we, yeah, some are with consultants with you. We also talk, of course, about some real time, real life cases, but sometimes these are customers or of us or other yeah, companies that are doing B2B e-commerce but are not using SANA. That's actually also funny to have them in the show. They also they also are there. And we're just sharing what's going good and what's going, going bad and what are the learnings on making it successful. Are you a small or medium-sized wholesaler that currently processes your transactions manually? Or maybe you're a D2C merchant that is looking to expand and add a B2B e-commerce channel but don't know how. Well, if you're ready to take the next steps on your B2B merchant journey, check out Mikata.cloud today to find out more about the e-commerce platform built from the ground up for small and medium B2B merchants. That's Mikata.cloud, M-I-K-A-T-A dot cloud. Yeah, and look, I think what's most amazing is that a couple of years ago, I was <clears throat> consulting to a global manufacturer and distributor of automotive and tractor trailer equipment. Mm -hmm. They were a multi-billion dollar company based out of, I think it was Malaysia or Singapore they were based out of, and not one single division of their company, not one dollar of that multiple, I think they were doing three or four billion dollars a year in revenue, not one dollar of that came through any form of electronic commerce, not $1. And it just blew my mind that a company that was global in nature was a combination manufacturer, wholesaler, and distributor. So they made some of their own products, plus they whole, they were a distributor in certain regions of other people's products. So their catalog was hundreds of thousands of products and a global player, no e-commerce. Now, that as you say, doesn't really happen that much anymore in B2C, D2C. And if it does, it makes headline digital news, the likes of mm H&M, -hmm. which, which yep. uh, fam famously only, it, it really took the pandemic to force yep. them to introduce e-commerce. They historically had never done e-commerce. They had historically never offered click and collect. And when they did, they offered it on a very local regional basis and they didn't offer it globally. And all of a sudden the pandemic hit and some of these holdouts, I think Primark is another famous yeah. holdout. I want to name that uh, one the, because that was it, a famous one uh, as well. It finally went online. I think these are the last ones. That's big news. Yeah. And they were famous for yeah. not, for resisting yeah. as opposed to adopting. They were famous for resisting mm -hmm. e-commerce or omni-channel in any way, shape or form. And they basically their board said, we have no intention pre-COVID. We have no intention of introducing e-commerce or omni-channel into our business. We feel our business yeah. model works. When our people can talk to customers face to face and provide that personalized service. And, but what I never saw when they were talking about those things was how you can offer personalized service via digital channels. They, ne they never talked about that. They only talked about what you couldn't do digitally, not what you could do digitally. And, but on the B2B side, the ones that do e-commerce or introduce e-commerce or introduce omni-channel, they're the ones that make the headlines, not the ones that don't. Because it is still the lion's share are either not doing any form of automation at all, so over 40%, somewhere between 40 and 50%, depending on region, yeah. or the ones that are doing digital commerce today, they have EDI. That's the lion's share of digital commerce for B2B is EDI. It's something like, I think the stat is 75% of existing digital commerce for B2B is done via EDI. And then the rest is punch out or e-com, right? So yeah. e-com is just a teeny tiny little sliver of the B2B world today. And so those guys that, that implement e-commerce, they are the ones making the headlines. They're the ones making the news. And what I think a lot of these B2B, brand, B2B brands that don't understand it, that B2C and D2C brands have long since figured out is that, hey, if we can become the poster child for a good implementation of e-commerce, we'll get invited to speak at events. 
We'll get a bunch of whole, uh, we'll get a ton of free media. We're going to get a bunch of earned media, free exposure. We're go, our brand is going to be much more at the forefront of the minds of potential consumers because of what we're doing that is cutting edge. And the B2Bs are only just starting to wake up to that fact. They're only just starting to wake up to the fact that if we do e-commerce well or even just do it at all, we now all of a sudden are going to be the poster child for B2B e-commerce implementation. That's going to help put us on the map in ways that a field sales rep could never do. It's going to open doors for us that can't get opened any other way. And so I think you look at somebody like a Caterpillar, for example, they are featured all over the digital press for B2B. Like I, I seem to see an article about Bloody Caterpillar every other week at every single B2B conference they are asked to speak. And in fact, at the most recent DC, DC 360 conference, they were a headline speaker, Caterpillar, just because there's so few of us out there that, that are executing yeah. on this and doing it successfully. So these brands need to realize that by opening the kimono, not only are you going to help the industry get better, but you are going to put yourself on the map as someone who customers should deal with because of the frictionless experience that they're going to have with you. Yeah, front runners, right? So that, that is definitely the case. And yeah, once again, yeah, we see more and more customers that are actually proud of being and, and doing a good job online. And they are also making a lot of success. They, but I think also the driving force is just to uh, where companies struggle with as well is the fact that a lot of these B2B organizations yeah, rely on these, on these relationships and and the and these salespeople you know they met on events but may, some of these are yeah the smaller ones are also family owned or f more family businesses uh, larger ones as well point here what i want to make is that this knowledge is in all the people's heads on these salespeople they know the price list or they know which spare part goes where what you need to do what you not need to do which ingredients you can combine to create something all that you know very practical but very important knowledge is in their heads but also some of these are getting older of this workforce and they are going to retirement and there is nobody that is replacing them or it is hard to replace them yeah so the knowledge is running away from the company and in uh, big time so you need to adopt and you need to capture that and you need to evolve that in something that is more scalable or more future proof yeah and that is that whole that transforming that into digital and once again, that's really complex, but yeah, how to put somebody, yeah, I literally had the question last week from a prospect saying, how are you going to put all that knowledge which is in the heads of our salespeople into a system or into a solution? And that's not easy, but the way we, we approach it is that we say, Hey, let's, that's a great challenge. We can solve it technically for you. So we have a solution or a platform that is very flexible that we can handle these different scenarios, these different industry specific our segment specific needs that you have and and that we also have a lot of things that we can map data or can capture data we can work with product information management systems that can be a good starting point for that to capture that data and then we work with that etc etc and then step by step you're peeling up the onion and then we get to the core and say hey yeah we let's we redesign your b2b journey we compose that and we success success we make it happen and and that is what yeah once again where companies are struggling with and i think where yeah vendors like us are really in need or helping out to to make that to make that to solve the, the, these problems and to make the b2b dream come true and are you also seeing that most platform vendors in the b2b space they are also a hybrid agency of sorts because in the world because there's a high level of maturity there so for example you yeah. If I sign up for Shopify or I sign up for Big Commerce or if I sign up for Salesforce Commerce Cloud or whatever it is, those vendors are not going to deliver anything for me. They're going to deliver mm -hmm. the platform. But if I want yeah. a complex custom implementation, I must go through an agency partner or a freelancer mm -hmm. or whatever it is to get my solution implemented, integrated, etc. But I notice a common theme in the B2B world that was common in the B2C world early on, which is that vendors tend to also be hybrid agencies, hybrid consultants, et cetera, because they're needing to seed the market with their system, yes. with their technology, with their platform. Then once there's enough grassroots demand in the market for their platform, then they can slowly start to pull away from doing delivery on their own platform. And they can then take on agency partners, for example, that become upskilled in their platform and can do customizations and implementations and integrations of their platform. And so I feel like we're, again, we're probably 10 years behind the B2C world 
where almost every B2B specific tech vendor out there does some form of implementation of their technology today, whether that's whole or in part or in combination with an agency, because there just isn't enough agency capability out there yet around B2B. And there's, I would guess, 80 to 90% of agencies out there specialize in not B2B. And so they need to upskill on understanding the B2B world. They need to upskill on B2B specific technologies before they can become an effective partner of those technologies. And has that been your experience at Sana as well? That, hey, we actually have to implement our own technology in many instances, because there's just not many agencies out there that can own this piece. No, yeah, you're, you're mentioning a very valid point. So especially in the beginning, I think we are doing we were doing the majority by ourselves. So lucky enough, we are now we have roughly, let's say, uh, 100 partners that are really active. We have more, let's say, signed partners or reselling partners, but 100 partners that, all, all over the world that are really active. Some of them are guys or ERP vendors that are taking an extra business there and understanding their most of the time their industries or their, their segmentation and and they and that's heavily focused on B2B then as well uh, and also but also other agencies but yeah still yeah 50 it's 50 50 now for us so 50 percent in terms of business is coming from direct from our partners the other is, di- is business that's coming directly to us and and also in terms of implementation I would say yeah 50 percent is done by partners with the help of us or yeah or actually solo solo by partners and the other 50% is we are doing the maybe more complex cases still or the larger cases we are doing ourselves simply because yeah we are already on a journey now for many years and we are still learning in the B2B space and we are capturing that that knowledge and that is not easily not easily you do not get that easily right you cannot just say okay let's I start a B2B agency today and tomorrow I will have a client and in a year I will have 20 super successful cases. You need a deep knowledge about, once again, solving that complexity in moving companies from something which is not digital into digital. And yeah, once again, that's a different journey than with consumers. And that's also, we are doing really a lot of work to keep our people also for a long time. We try not to see a quick retention or rate because yeah, it takes time to, especially people to onboard them, to learn them the knowledge area and the expertise. And and we want to make sure that we are the thought leaders. So we are putting a lot of attention on that. So yeah, that's definitely a, a big difference and, and an interesting topic indeed. And uh, yeah, I think we are uh, we are doing well there. We uh, just to summarize, we started when we needed to do everything, but now I'm actually quite happy that we are can work with a part of the channel because that also gives us the ability to grow further. Otherwise, I think we would stuck because uh, yeah, then you are as as successful as that you can do projects, right? And the amount of projects. So yeah, and that's still the trend. I think we will at some point in time have a larger, we have a large strategic program running on partners. So there is, we will have more and more partners. That that is a growing number. So I think, yeah, here again, B2C is, B2B is following B2C, right? Also on, on this angle of the business. And I think there's two other trends I'd like you to comment on that, that I've seen over Mm -hmm. the last, say, 10 years that I'm sure you've seen as well is the transition from mostly on-premise technologies to mostly SaaS technologies across the commerce sphere, not just cloud, but specifically multi-tenant SaaS technology is becoming the norm. You still have some legacy holdouts. Adobe Commerce slash Magento is a legacy holdout of being largely on-prem or pass, which is, I consider that on-prem on the vendor's Mm -hmm. hosting infrastructure. We're seeing all of the pretty much all of the top vendors across almost every category of technology moving to a multi-tenant SaaS model because the merchant doesn't want to have to think about PCI compliance. They don't want to have to think about security patching. They don't want to have to think about upgrades. They don't want to have to think about scaling infrastructure when all they want to do is go sell more stuff. So this has been a trend that's been happening at an accelerated pace over the last decade combined with vertical specific technologies. So I had Chris Harrington from Gen Alpha slash Equip360, and their e-commerce platform is 100% B2B focused, but it's also further focused on just the automotive and heavy equipment industries. Mm -hmm. Those industries have such unique requirements that when they built their business, they thought, we just cannot, we are not capable of building a generic enough B2B e-commerce platform to service 20 different verticals 
we have got to niche down. If we're going to be successful, we have no choice but to niche down and really try to service this industry at a super high level. So maybe you can speak a little bit to the trend towards SaaS, multi-tenant SaaS, and the trend towards niching down even by vendors so that they can become a standout as opposed to being average at everything, becoming a little bit more of a standout in their niche. Yeah, no, great question. And you have, you have gone through that path as well because yeah, back in the days we started actually as an on-prem solution because yeah, that was, as, and then also especially in B2B on the customers we were serving, that was also their need, right? They were running all those systems on-premise, sometimes just in in below the desks of, of people there for very small companies, maybe which was less of a good way to do that in terms of uptime and so on. But then, yeah, we also knew that this was there was needed. Let's say that we did we needed to be there as well. So yeah, we started as an on-prem solution. But yeah, we, I think six years ago, or we started what we call our SaaS journey, we, and we had already quite a decent customer base, which we needed to transform. But that was not easy because yeah, uh, we were like an yeah, we were actually a product, but we were still doing a lot of implementations ourselves. And then moving into a 100% SaaS solution where you have automatic upgrades or that's yeah, just going automatically, multi-tenant indeed, uh, running in, in public cloud on, on many different regions and so on. That was a, quite a journey. But yeah, we are now at 85% of our customer base is running on our 100% SaaS solution, which we call Sana Commerce Cloud. It's our flagship product now. And yeah, we still have some legacy customers because yeah, like with an ERP, it's also sometimes not so easy to change if you are having a running and, and multiple millions or even billions are running through that store. It's a, that's a dangerous piece to touch. But yeah, we are migrating them to Sana Commerce Cloud and we are, and sometimes they also move away because that is what we, uh, when migrating to Sana Commerce Cloud or creating that product, yeah, we also needed to make tough decisions that say, hey, First of all, we didn't do any retail or we do not do B2C, so let's drop all of that. We are, there are B2C stores running on Sana, but let's say, uh, we, we all, if we look at the numbers, let's say 37% is what we say B2C or open or combined store, let's say. So 67 per or, or, yeah, so, yeah, so 37% roughly, 63% is, let's say, pure B2B, open or closed. But so behind the login or open, but is is purely focused on B2B. So we are doing also some B2C, but still that was even more niche. As well as on the features and functionality or the benefits that you're supplying so that we say, hey, we need to make tough decisions saying, hey, we want to do this really well and, and this we are not going to pursue. So we went more into indeed automotive as well, industry, food, manufacturing, businesses, as well as healthcare or chemicals, where there's a lot of complexity is there. But fashion, maybe we dropped a bit. That's still we have a couple of fashion customers, but that, that is less of a focus. And I think, yeah, I think it's very wise f from a vendor to to have that niche focus because then you can make a true difference for your consumers. And sometimes it feels like really scary because you say, yeah, you just make a small portion of the market. But at least how we see it, the B two B market in general is much larger than the consumer market in terms of trillions money wise if you take a niche and yeah our niche we yeah we are focusing currently on yeah mostly manufacturing distributing wholesale companies and yeah and if they have sap or microsoft dynamics as their back-end systems uh, erp crm and so on of course now we are actually dropping that message a bit because we can handle also uh, in that composability topic we are handle also all the other side systems or the systems around it maybe we call them the systems of differentiation but i want to say there is that is still a very large ocean to fish in so that is still yeah we are still growing very rapidly and so we, we are okay i think we can we are even sometimes having discussions on maybe we should even be more of a niche so even focus more because then we can do even better and get more of these right and grow from there so yeah, I think that is also a big difference. In B2C, you can most of the say, yeah, we just take them all, in, especially in consumable uh, products or things that are uh, askew, right? In financial services or these kind of things, you have differentiation, obviously, but everything which is just packageable or something that you're shipping, that is, I think, yeah, you can roughly take everything. Easier. Absolutely. And how are you seeing your future in the context of competing with effectively for mindshare in the marketplace against 
the likes of punch out solutions or EDI solutions, which oftentimes B2B businesses, when they're small, they can't afford mm-hmm. those solutions because they're really expensive. So that's why I think there's still so much manual commerce out there in, yeah. in B2B land. But certainly, I think that if you're a larger company and you don't do any digital commerce at all today, I think you know they're, they're very rarely, in my experience, going to implement, for example, EDI and self-service e-com all in one go. They're going to have to make a choice. They're going to have to be a little bit methodical in terms of how they roadmap introducing digital commerce into their business. And then they also are going to have to look at their channel mix. They're going to say, okay, we could sell on maybe a, maybe we could sell directly from our ERP or list directly from our ERP in a B2B marketplace like FAIR or something like that before we even introduce self-service e-com into our business. So there's a lot of hard decisions that B2B brands need to make when they're thinking about e-commerce. They're thinking, okay, what is the, what is our go-to-market proposition around e-commerce or digital commerce, for lack of a better term, or a more umbrella term mm-hmm. would be digital mm-hmm. com- What does that look like? What does our channel mix look like? What does our internal capability need to look like? And so when you guys go to market and as you're starting to continue to niche down, are you targeting primarily brands that have already made those decisions and they know what they want to do and they're like, yes, we need to have self-service e-commerce in here. We, we know what roughly umbrella, what our requirements are to, from a manual process today or an analog process today, the process that we need to transition to digital equivalents? Or are you actually going through the process of helping these businesses even identify which type of digital commerce they should start with, what kind of data they need to enable that, and what kind of channel mix they should have as a start? Or are you getting them a little bit further down the chain than when they've made more of those strategic decisions before they get to you? Yeah, that's a great question. I think to answer it in a very easy way, we still, or the trends what we're seeing is we we thought we would see more and more second and third generation B2B commerce, but still it is now at least that what we see at the prospects is like 50-50. And then of course I consider sometimes they tried a little bit like a proof of concept and then I still see them as a first generation, right? 50% of the prospects that are entering SANA, they are having nothing yet or just a proof of concept and they tried a little but they are, they really need to start an even very large enterprise organizations because they just never had the time or the or never the problem was never there to make that shift and now the need is there some and a lot of these organizations do not know that they have a problem so we also identify that for them for example if you have a if you see that their sales force is getting older or getting retire getting to retirement and you need to shift that then maybe they do not know, but we know from other customers that they will be in a problem, in a problematic situation in a year or 10 years or so, right? If you do not capture that knowledge or transfer that some, to something else. Or some of the IT managers do not know that say, yeah, I'm just fighting these tickets every week, every month and have thousands of tickets, but I'm just handling them. I'm just adding more resources to it because yeah, the company is growing, but they never understood that there is a root cause that can help them to solve or and that there is a root cause and that you can solve these kind of things. So that is how they enter the organization, that's first generation. And then the second or third generation, they also arrived at our desk and they are most of the time having an adoption issue. They say, you, we have already three or four years, this and that platform, where we tried first this and then that, and our adoption stops at 30%. And we believe we need to go to 70, 80 or 90 because we have already ne- recognized that yeah, we need to change and we need to do something with our sales force, we need to put them on other projects. We want to explore new markets, for example, or we want to be more cost effective or a variety of reasons, or they understand that they have a lot of tickets in IT to solve order errors or something like that. And then they say, yeah, but can you help us? And then of course we explain how we do projects and how we, how customers, how we can make them successful. And not only from a technology perspective, because I think, yeah, that's just technology, but also how you do a good implementation or how you need to run a B2B e-commerce store in general in in any kind of organization. That it requires a multidisciplinary team uh, that you need to bring IT and marketing and sales together on the table, right? And it's not only a sales dream or a IT show or a marketing show, right? So that is uh, these things we all bring there. And then also to take uh, give an answer on the EDI or punch out is that I think now in the time where you compose the different journeys that we are having or in that era we are now transforming to, we see a lot of organizations that we can help in, in some parts, changing or partly replacing EDI because sometimes they are outdated systems and they are not functioning that well. It's not transparent, let's say. And with the solutions we are providing, we are giving the transparency. But 
what is I think the most powerful thing is that we are going really hand in hand. So yeah, that's just the nature of our approach. But I think other vendors can do that as well. But at least how we do it is we, we since we have we are so tightly integrated or, uh, with the other systems, we also have the data from let's say, and from transactions that are from other sources or from offline transactions or from EDI or from punch out and whatsoever. But to give that holistic overview in a portal or in an app is very convenient for your B2B buyers because maybe the maturity of the orders is going through an EDI process which is already in place. But the ability to look into these orders, see what's going on, but maybe also if there is a marketing campaign, just quickly add a couple of extras there just before you know the next run is or just maybe order some extra manuals or something different than the regular assortments, right? Or just looking up some product information or just do invoicing or that is all also part of that whole B2B buyer journey. And that's more than just a transaction. And that all builds up to make that relationship, actually transferring that relationship that you had, otherwise you would call the sales agent, but now we can put it in a digital place. So I think that it's going, at least with the customers we have, go pretty well hand in hand. And it's also actually a beautiful use case. And I always challenge prospects saying, yeah, no, if we do everything with EDI, we are already 100%. But I think, yeah, you can, you can even do more if you give the transparency and and make that relationship a little bit more um, yeah, tangible. And as we come to the close of our time together, and I really appreciate you sharing so generously from your experience and your background and doing this for as long as you have, I really appreciate your time with me today. One other trend that I'm seeing, and I'd love to know whether you're seeing it as well, is that historically, when a B2B e-commerce platform was implemented for the first time, it was always behind a login. So it was mm-hmm. effectively wall, a walled garden. And you had to log in, you had to authenticate to even be able to access the catalog, to be able to see your pricing, etc. And certainly to be able to place an order, you had to be authenticated. Now I'm seeing a lot of, at the very least, second and third generation B2B e-commerce businesses, I'm seeing them treat it much more instead of just as a replenishment ordering portal, now as an acquisition channel for new B2B customers. And you can either, when you arrive at the website, maybe you can only see the catalog items. Maybe you can create an account actually for the first time, but when you create an account for the first time, you can only pay via business credit card. You're not on account for your first order when you first authenticate and create an account. When you first log in for the first time, maybe you see the highest, the most restrictive catalog and the highest prices that are available across the catalog, almost like a retail catalog, but it's like the RP price of of that B2B business. So I'm seeing this concept of, okay, we want to use this for lead generation as a lead generation, as a lead magnet for our business to securing new B2B buyers, because oftentimes those B2B buyers are starting their buying journey in Google, just like B2B to C customers are. They're shopping. They're looking for a supplier via Google. And if you're not represented there on the long tail of your catalog in Google because you've walled it off and you've stuck it behind a robots.txt file, then all of a sudden now you're not going to be represented. You're not going to be seen as the preferred supplier of those goods in the market. People aren't aren't even going to know you exist unless a sales rep comes out and knocks on your door or digitally knocks on your door. And so I'm seeing this mindset shift in the industry. It's slow, to be fair, and the vast majority are still behind a login. I'd say in excess of 75% are still behind a login. But these B2B brands are slowly having a mindset shift to, hey, this actually could be a massive lead generator for our business and able to secure new customers with zero initial intervention by a sales rep. No, definitely. We see the trend in in looking at our data. We saw that the majority of the B2B online platforms in the past were behind the login for sure. And not anymore. I think the majority now of our stores that we're having are open. So that's already the trend, right? But maybe more, more funny is that you already mentioned so many different scenarios or functionality to say, hey, open with less pricing, without less pricing, with showing pricing, or maybe the highest price. That is once again the complexity. And I can tell you, Anna is supporting all of that just by configuration. So no, I can promise you, no, any line of code needs to happen there. But I also know that if you want to do all these scenarios on a platform which is optimized for B2C, you will end up in, in, in customization in hell. or at least <laughs> in hell, yes. <laughs> Maybe that's it. But uh, so that is once again that B2B focus just to say why, why we are doing what we are doing. But back to the topic, let's say on the trend, 
Yes, if of course, if the, the type of product that you sell is available to share online, because we also have a bunch of customers that are selling certain products that are not for everybody's eyes. And yeah, that is still needs that you need to have certification or that you need to have regulation. So that's another layer of complexity and also another layer of security. And, and also these things we are spotting out of the box, you understand? So once again, another piece of the puzzle of the buyer journey, of a B2B buyer journey that is that needs to that you need to be aware of. But taking that aside, yes, especially if you are a little bit more mature and you say, hey, we have the basics done right, because I think the majority can first benefit of just automating orders or placing them online versus offline. You have already a huge benefit on cost savings and whatsoever, making sure that your sales department is not bothered anymore with rep repetitive work, etc. So you already have a huge win there. But once after two or three years, you, you want to maybe explore other opportunities, then it's really great to open up that world and work on your brand image. And B2B organizations are getting more capable in doing so. And also, yeah, a product like Sana is supporting that. And so that, yeah, with things like we, what we have, the visual designer that every marketeer or every person in the organization can, as a, what say, what we call citizen developer, can use that local no code platform to make something beautiful and use it as an acquisition channel for new business, new countries maybe to explore. Maybe the same product, but packaged differently, market differently. And yeah, that is interesting. I think an example of that is a company that is called Ferdo from Denmark, which is a customer from Sana for many years. They are selling actually wood pallets to, to heat your house. It's these small wood pieces. And they are doing that in the B2B channel for, you can buy these kind of bags on bulk, but you can also buy them in a DIY store or something. But they said, hey, we can use these same wood pallets. We can also use that for cat litter, for yes. animals to put it there. Or we can use these same wood pallets for horse bedding, right? So three different use cases for the same product, three different channels. Three different three packaging, different, three, di three different pricing levels, three different sets of wholesale but customers. The core, but the core product is the same, right? And that's also how you can scale your business and how what we use as inspiration to for other organizations to, to look into. How can you repackage, rebrand? explore new things just by content yeah, of course an id needs to be there as well but and a need but the tool is supporting it as well absolutely what would your as we come down to the close of our time together if a b2b brand today whether it's a wholesale wholesaler manufacturer distributor if they're selling to other businesses and they've mm -hmm. never done e-commerce before and they're considering it because they realize that's the future maybe they're a family-owned business and the Child, the child or the grandchild of the founder is now taking over and running the business and they see the future as digital. What would be your top one or two tips as they embark on this journey? Because because I know that most of the clients I deal with, it's pretty overwhelming when they first start thinking about e-commerce, mm -hmm. particularly if they don't have any internal capability today around e-commerce that feels like, it feels like shark infested waters that they're going into. And it's quite mm -hmm. scary to change your entire go-to-market model, it's not changing your business model per se, but it's definitely changing your go-to-market proposition and your value prop. What would you say is the one or two things they really need to absolutely nail from day one to help guarantee or to help ensure a higher level of success, both in terms of project success, but also adoption success? What be, yeah. would be the one or two top things you would say they need to do to prepare for this journey because it's not a destination it's a journey correct that is maybe already uh, one is that is not a that is a journey so i will not count that one but that is already that's so accept that it is a journey and it is not some just one off project but i think that you need to have a good start the good start is in my opinion that it is not a once again an it a sales or a marketing show but a multidisciplinary team and then especially of course, you need to look at your B2B buyer and map that journey and know that journey really well. But sales as one of your major stakeholders or accepting that your sales as your major stakeholder in adoption or in the success of this project is a really important understanding. Never start a project as a competing thing against the existing sales force, but use it as their vehicle to grow further. So not saying, hey, you will not be compensated or something. No, you for, mention it differently, say, Every, day, every customer of you that's placing your order online, you will compensate it more, for example, and you will see adoption will grow really well. 
But if you make that very big mistake of saying, no, sales is running like it is, it's okay, but we are going to start something new. Again, then you have this competition. I can tell you there will be failed projects. So that's one. Make sure that you have these stakeholders on the table and start from there. And where sales is probably your biggest stakeholder as well, but also understand the B2B buyer journey. So in the second tip I want to, uh, to give, and I have a third one as well as a bonus, but the second one I want to give is look at the right KPIs at the right moment of time. Often we see customers struggle that they are looking at, for example, revenue, but that is a very lagging KPI. You need to look at leading KPIs in a month or three month time frame, And then after that time frame, shift to another KPI because there you can make the impact. So we are guiding our customers as well with, with something which we call the Sana success track, where we are just seeing on what maturity level you are. But sometimes it can be as easy as we just starting with, okay, let's just get a hundred customers registered and log in and browse around. We do that as a target for the first month, first three months or something like that. Then the second target is, okay, let's see if these can transact or that we stimulate the sales force to help these customers transact, etc. And then from there, we take another KPI and say, okay, we then be focusing on making this from 100 to 1000. So step by step, we are not looking at revenue yet, but we know that the revenue will flow because we are focusing on these leading indicators. We have all that knowledge from all those years. We have all those KPI trees. We know which leading indicators you need to look at on which moment of time in your maturity level. So that's looking at the right KPIs at the right time. And last but not least is, yeah, the topic that I said about from a technical perspective is that realize that for B2B to make that perfect journey for your B2B buyer, you will, whatever solution you'll take, you will need that integration to have pricing, real-time pricing, or do not underestimate, do not forget it because sometimes we even forget it in budgets saying, hey, okay, we have no budgets for that, or we didn't think about it. But we know from the data that it is Gartner saying 60% for CRM systems and also big commerce systems like that. Our own investigation market research shows us that 37% is still a decent portion, right? So if you miss that portion to budget or to think about, or at least that there is a challenge there, then you're already running steps behind in the, in, in the product or in the process or the project you're running. And then of course there are solutions that are optimized or that are focusing on a niche like B2B and integrations. And then, yeah, we are, we can make a difference there in, in, in these projects in adoption, but as well in, in bringing actually complex B2B online. And that's, yeah, these are my two tips and one bonus. Love it. Absolutely fantastic. I've seen that last tip in particular. I've seen integration as part of a large scale B2B implementation. I've seen the integration be from an investment and time perspective, be equal to the front end implementation costs that, that sometimes the system integration piece can be as complex as time consuming and as expensive as the rest of the project. And so I totally agree with you. I think if you go in with eyes wide open and you have a really good understanding of the likely timeline for these scale of projects. The likely cost, you're not going to know down to the penny, but if you can know, give or take 10%, that, hey, this is the type of investment we're going to need upfront, just Ecom 101 stuff to get up and running and enabled on this stuff, then there's nothing boards like worse than or like less than surprises, right? They don't like mid-project for you to come back and go, I need an extra 50% of the project budget. That is never going to yes. go down. So I think the deeper dive discovery that you can do upfront for B2B projects, because in my experience, they tend to take a lot more discovery, both in terms of depth and time. There's a lot more discovery required with these B2B businesses as a rule on average versus your traditional B D to C business. And if you don't do your homework upfront and you don't have a really solid architecture and project plan put together right from day one, then there will guarantee to be surprises and a much higher likelihood of project failure. So very good tips. I think those are super, super relevant, super timely. Now we're at the time where I get to flip the script. I get to hand the microphone over to you. I get to let you ask me one question, any question you like. So Arno Ham from Sana Commerce, what is your question for me today? 
Yeah, everybody's of course talking about AI all the time and generative AI and that kind of topics, right? You are also, of course, the e-commerce expert and maybe you've seen a lot of B2C things, but also in B2B, yeah, we are working on a lot of opportunities in that area, but I want to know from you if maybe you can share a couple, maybe I've not heard about it yet, so that I can get some inspiration on, on the things we are working on. Yeah, look, you raise a really good point. I think AI is getting a lot of airtime. It's sucking all the oxygen out of the room for investors talking about anything other than AI. I think it's sucking mm -hmm. the oxygen out of the room for vendors because unless you put AI at the beginning of your name or at the end of the, your name, you're not going to get the coverage, the press coverage, the notoriety. And so I think AI is seeing an incredible amount of signs of early hype cycle stuff that we see with every hype cycle that comes along, we're seeing a lot of those trends of the traditional hype cycle being applied to AI. And whilst I think that's good in the sense that absolutely AI, large language models, machine learning, all that stuff, what most people don't realize is that stuff has been in development for 20, 30 years in the IT space more broadly. And it's only come to the fore of the human psyche and the cultural discussion has come to the fore with the advent of large language models running across a large enough data cohort to be super useful when using it, using just normal English language type of discussions. And I think ChatGPT has done a good job of slapping the most user-friendly front end on top of AI that's ever existed. And of course, that's, that is what has created the discussion. That is what has created the adoption. It's not so much that the technology has leaped ahead so far so fast. I think it's a culmination of effort over a sustained period of time that we're now at a place where AI seems almost like magic, right? And again, that's probably the size of the data and the sources of the data and the vectors of the data that's making that happen. But what I like to tell customers, because I, I get clients coming to me and saying, how can we integrate AI into our business? How can we take advantage of this AI revolution in our business? And nine times out of 10, they can't. Or when I say they can't, I, they're not going to integrate this AI directly into their business or directly into their stack. They are going to consume AI via their partners, the, via their partner technology. So if they're, let's say they're working with a search and merch platform today, right? That platform is likely already integrating some form of AI into their technology today. And then they will be able to benefit from that AI because they use that technology. Or if we think of help desks or live chat or whatever, now large language models are being applied to help desk. When we think of the knowledge base that sits behind most help desk technology, that help desk, that knowledge base, it, even if you had previously a chatbot enabled, it would need to re-index your content. You would need to train it. You would need to update it manually to keep it current over a sustained period of time for it to be useful at all for customers. Now, in the back end of Zendesk and Gorgeous and most other help desk technologies that have an associated knowledge base, you literally flick a switch and now it stays updated in real time using large language models across your specific domain of knowledge and experience. So whenever you, in, whenever you add a new knowledge base page internally, all of a sudden that is now indexed automatically and now it can enrich the customer experience across all touch points. So what I like to think of is that most businesses that are in a panic today about how they can adopt AI into their business, they don't really need to panic because most of their vendors of technology already thinking about, already integrating AI into the core stack. And so they're going to benefit from AI almost tangentially, whether they like it or not. But one thing that I, and I had Ryan Imlach on my podcast recently as a guest mentor, and he was talking about how he uses ChatGPT to write custom suite script for him to run in NetSuite to add automations that he doesn't have to go to his NetSuite partner for every little thing now. He, ChatGPT can help him automate certain things inside NetSuite that he would normally and historically have had to go to his NetSuite partner to build for him. So yes, you will consume AI directly through these large language models in some instances, but for the vast majority of use cases, you're going to get it through your existing tech vendors. And so I, I think the panic out there is a little bit unwarranted because you're just going to – a rising tide floats all boats. Yet again, that same saying, it's the 80-20 rule. that This is going to benefit tech companies first, and then as a second 
order effect, it's going to affect your business. That would be my general high level advice. No, really, I like it because I think that is also in our app, we have quite some things you're already doing. We see the power of it. And as a vendor, we can help our customers. So yeah, in that sense, indeed, the advice can be, especially for maybe the less mature customers, just don't panic, sit back and relax. And vendors like, like us, like Sana, we will make sure that it is embedded because we, we see the opportunity and also we see the use cases and we see the benefit and the value. And I mean, making that realize. Yeah, great. Just uh, sit back and relax. Absolutely. And if people want to find out more about Sana Commerce or get in touch with you directly, I, you're very active on LinkedIn. So I'm guessing if people want to reach out to you and have a chat with you, yeah. Arno Ham, A R N O, surname H A M, and they can find you on LinkedIn under that name. For sure. Is that the best yeah. place for people to get a hold of you? Yeah, definitely. The great start point is there. Just look me up on LinkedIn, say, get connected or send me a DM if you want to know more or react to one of the posts I'm doing on a daily basis. I like to talk like you a lot about B2B and B2B e-commerce. So definitely, if you are into that topic, look at my LinkedIn. But if you like to listen or to consume information by listening or watching video, you can watch also the podcast, which is B2B e-commerce integrated on Spotify, YouTube, or Apple Music. So B2B e-commerce integrated. And last but not least, if you just want to know the reg regular things about Sana, so just go to sanacommerce.com. Yeah, and I'll put, look, I'll put all these links in the show notes anyway, but it's sana, S-A-N-A awesome. hyphen commerce.com. If they want to check out the website, then they can go ahead and do that and they can click through on the show links and I'll link to your LinkedIn profile and I'll link to Sana Commerce and I'll link to the podcast. So yeah, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and your wisdom with the audience today. I learned a lot. Look, you've been doing this a long time. You've been focused on B2B longer than I have even. So look, it's always great to learn from industry, I guess veterans is the term I would use, and you're absolutely an industry veteran. So thank you for all that you do for the industry. Thank you for sharing so openly and so honestly from your knowledge from your experience, trying to help level up the industry as a whole. So thank you so much. And I can't wait to speak to you again on the podcast in the future, mate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. And thanks for the opportunity. And yeah, keep up the good work. If you're into B2B commerce and you would like to be a guest on B2B Commerce Corner, simply go to ecommerceedge.net, click on more info, then click on be a guest and fill out your details and we will get back to you straight away.